2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 15, all the way to 17, reading, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for journey mercies to thy house. We gather now to seek thy mercies for cleansing and washing thoroughly in the blood of our Saviour. And Lord, we pray that now you would use BBK to establish our faith and our practice in our own personal lives and in the church, that you may have godly people and a strong church to serve you in this very untoward generation in our times. So be in our midst to bless. We pray for understanding. We pray for attention, attentiveness. And Lord, only the Holy Spirit can inspire and change us. So we pray that you send him to work in our hearts. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The importance of studying God's word. Now, maybe let us try, all right? Let us try. What is the Bible? All right? We always memorize things to help us. Um, oops. It's gone. To help us have biblical um, understanding of biblical understanding and remembrance so that we are reminded. Okay, so I'm giving you a lot of time to remember now. Okay, what is God's word? Okay, let's try. What is God's word? Cornelius. God's word. What is the Bible? All right, let's start with what is the Bible. The Bible. All right, Cornelius, please go ahead. Say again. It is? Perfect. Now, we, we, we go through the whole definition properly. What is the Bible? Let's begin here. Uh, Thomas, you got the easiest one. Very good. The Bible is first God's Word, not man's Word. God's Word. Okay? Then it is... Um, let's try. Uh, uh, Caleb. Very good. It is inspired. Next in, Cornelius. Try again. Not there yet. Inspired and in, uh, Phoebe. Infallible, okay, or inerrant. Very good. Inerrant, inspired, inerrant, and it is... Okay, next one. Uh, Yenwei. Very good. Preserved. But how, how is it preserved? Because some say it's preserved, but it is not. There's an adjective, starts with P. Very good, right? Perfectly preserved. Okay. Um, and then, for who? For us. All right? Because some say it is perfectly preserved, but in heaven. All right? It's only perfectly preserved in heaven. We don't really have it. We have to figure it out. Now, all this is done... By who? By God. All right? Actually, even this inspired must be divinely inspired. Okay? Not by men. Okay, divinely inspired. So all this done perfectly by God for us, but we don't have it anymore. Is it true? Uh, Alex. Very good. Throughout... The ages, all right? Because some say, well, it is divinely inspired, they're inerrant, perfect, and perfectly preserved, but in the past, not only not for us, not anymore, it's only in heaven, but they also say it's something in the past, in the past. And instead of why, why is by God important? So today, because we have lost many things, so men, men must use um, um, textual criticism higher criticism to find out which are God's words. So man is the one who's preserving. 
All right, so I hope that we keep, remem keep remembering all this. It will build convictions in your heart, all right? Of course, all of them will have Bible verses. You can check it in your BBK books. Now, then we begin. Now, let me ask you, what is the use of God giving us His divinely preserved, inspired and preserved Word um, throughout all ages for us? What is the point of giving us that if we don't read it, we don't study it, we don't obey it, we can defend it till our face turn blue. All these things about the perfect Bible. But if we don't read it, then we miss the whole point. The whole point of God giving mankind a book that you can trust without a single doubt. And that is the whole problem with the modern versions today. You pick up a modern English version. It is not like the King James Bible. You pick up a modern English version, there will be many footnotes. All right, footnotes. This should not be here. This whole passage, all right, 10 over verses should not be here, should not be in the Bible. Or like we've been studying 1 John 5.17, 1 John 5, 7. Oh, no, this verse is, is, is added, so we must remove it. All that kind of things. When you read, when you pick up a Bible like that, when young believers first got saved, have no clue, and they read well, all these footnotes, this one maybe not here, maybe not there. Now, if you pick up a road directory, driving road directory, I know a lot of us don't use it, we use Google Map. All right, all right let's say uh, a software map. All right, you pick up a software map, software. And you know, from there, is, and they have a lot of caveats. All right? When you boot up, you say, oh, you know, actually, this road, probably not there. This road, we're not sure. Down here, well, you need to reach there, and then you figure it out. Would you even use such a map? You would not. You would not. Is it a surprise that today many Christians don't really read the Bible? Because of that, when you read, so many doubts are cast on God's word, maybe not much point reading. And when uh, the, past, the pastor is preaching from the word of God, how do we know even if those, those verses are supposed to be there? What's the point of obeying it? Now, why does God give us the perfect Bible? For a simple reason, that the Christian can trust it, every single word of it, every single um, command in it, every single phrase in it, with your life. With your life. You do not have to think, well, maybe it is added. Maybe this was added. Maybe that was not really what God says, but, well, the apostles decided on their own to put it in. Or later on, people added it in. So maybe I don't need to obey this because it's cultural. You see, that is the whole aim of Satan, to make you and I doubt the one thing that God made, God put effort into preserving perfectly after divinely inspiring it for us, giving us through all the ages, even now, even for your future great-grandchildren, they can read this book and be fully assured that they can embrace everything in it with no doubt and live by it without any reservations at all. That is why God gave us this Bible, all right? So, Christian, you must, you must understand why we contend for the perfect Bible. Now, let us turn to our BBK books. Now, today we will learn more things about the Word of God. Page 151 in the old book, right? A lesson on the importance of God's Word. Now, in the Christian life, in paragraph 1, there is nothing more important than knowing God's Word and knowing it well. Nothing more important than this. If there is the need for God to go through all that and continue to preserve a perfect word for us, now, do you think it is not important? It is supremely important for our life. What else does the Bible say about the word of God? Number one, it is light to the traveler. Let's read together. Thy lamp, thy word... Is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
Why does God give us that perfect word and make sure that we have it throughout the generations? Well, because it keeps you from stumbling. Light onto my path, light, uh, light onto my feet, lamp onto my feet, light onto my path. It is like God is telling us, you and I walk in a very dark world. You and I live in a world where you cannot see clearly. In fact, it is so dark. It is the darkness deceives you. That is the world we live in. So God says, I must make sure you have something that will never run out of battery, will always be reliable. Now, even when we go for our church camp, right, then we bring all those lamps and all that, we make sure we pack extra batteries, test the batteries before we go because we don't want to end up, well, not having light when we go and see the possums. But the Word of God is constant, is bright, is totally reliable. You don't have to worry that it is something that, well, may not be relevant now. Now, Christian, why do many believers fall into diverse sins? Why do many Christians make wrong choices in life? Why do many Christians even resist God's teachings? Simple reason. God says, walk this way. God says, broad is the way that leads to damnation, this narrow path. But we, we don't read it. So we do not know what is the narrow path. We do not know what path to take. Many Christians, after many years, then they join a sound church. Then they hear for the first time certain teachings from the Bible which has always been there. And very often, these people in their elderly age, they say, Pastor, I wish, I wish I knew these things in my younger life. I would not have made these choices. My children would have still been in church. My life would not be so ruined I would not have wasted three quarters of my life. So, friends, why? Because of the failure to use God's word. Where should I walk, Lord? You shine. These are dangerous places. Move away from it. All right, so number one, God also tells us his word is, is like a guide for, uh, for the traveler on this earth. Do you believe it? Now, when God uses all these analogies, these pictures. He don't do it for no reason. Try to change your thinking from now onwards. Remember basic Bible knowledge. This is BBK. These are the most basic things the Christian should have in terms of their thinking. How long have you been a Christian? Do you really see God's Word in this way? The most basic thing. Well, the test is this. Tonight, all right, drive to the darkest place you can find in Perth. Maybe it takes five hours to reach there. All right? Then switch off your car lights and keep driving. You say, Pastor, you must be crazy. We will never, ever think of doing that. I say, well, not only do that, put your whole family in it. All right? Your whole family in it and do that. They say, of course we can't do that. Just by myself, I'm already thinking it's crazy to do that. To put and risk my whole family in it, it is ridiculous. Well, do you really see, do you believe that God says that is what my word is to you? That is the world that we live in. That is how dark it is. That is how dangerous it is. That is where all the deep trenches are that you can fall and hurt yourself very badly, even die. That is how you protect your children and guide them as well. You say, of course we will turn on the light. Of course we will use the light. So that is why God gives us analogy, to paint that reality to us because we only see with our physical eyes. As a result, we think with our physical, what we see physically, that's all. But here God gives us a spiritual view of that. Did you read the Bible this week. How much did you read it? When you're in trouble and difficulties, do you turn to man for advice or do you seek the Word of God to guide you? What is your normal life when it comes to the Word of God? Well, that is why God gives us His perfect Word. Now, number two, God also says, 
that it is wholesome food for all, including the youngest. Let's read together. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So God's word not only says it prevents you, it guides you in this world, it helps you to grow while you are guided in this world. The Christian growth depends on the word of God. Which parent? Now, again, God uses um, analogies, pictures of our daily life that we're so used to. Which parent? All right, some of you are grandparents. We even imagine, all right, a newborn babe. You give birth. And then the mother leaves it crying and not feed it at all. Just assume that it's all right, don't have to feed it. And then the grand, as a grandparent, you go into the room, the child is, is so weak, is almost fainting, even dying. And as a grandparent, you say, hey, no need to feed. What are you doing? Why do you keep yourself so busy? So many things to do. You gave birth already, now go out and enjoy yourself. Why do you feed my grandchild? All right? No grandparent, no parent will ever think like that. So God uses this to say, you imagine when you get saved, the moment you get saved, you are a newborn babe. Remember what Christ told, told um, Nicodemus? You must be born again. Born again means it's literally you are a newborn babe in Christ with a total blank mind, with a total, totally um, um, changed way of thinking. God says babies Babies need milk to grow. I ask again, how often have you read the Bible this week? Or the week that have just passed? How often? Is it little wonder that we faint? We are weak. And we say, why am I not a stronger Christian? Well, herein lies the answer. But I want you also to notice, God says, as newborn babes desire the, milk, the sincere milk of the word. It means also this. Babies naturally desires milk. When they come out, they will cry when it's feeding time. When they're hungry, they will cry. Cry and scream. So this is the word they will desire. Newborn babies, they desire the word of God. A child of God that does not desire the word of God, there's only one reason, right? Even you know. You look at the child, the child doesn't want to eat, then the parents start crying. Why? Why? Why would the parent cry? Instead of saying, well, good, the child don't want to eat. I'm so free now. Why? Because you know the child must be sick. The child must be sick. And if the child don't eat, don't drink milk, it will eventually die. We have such great concern. So God uses the newborn babe to tell you. Now, Christian is unnatural. It's unnatural for you. In fact, God says as a child of God, there must be a craving for God's word. Well, it goes to say that also you eat a lot of junk food, you won't desire the sincere milk of the word. Well, you say you eat a lot of junk food, you just desire that instead. We have cravings for many things in the world. We love to watch the, the news. Not that the news are necessarily wicked. We love to read, docu read, read books on things like our hobbies and all that. We have a craving. We have a craving for knowledge, but not the sincere milk of the word. That is the problem. So Christian, this is basic Bible knowledge. I want to emphasize again, I, whatever age you are, you must now begin to say there must be a serious change in the way I think about God's word. Now I say again, if your thought of God's word, it is not it is optional, it is not so necessary. I hear it on Sunday already, that is good enough. Then you must awaken yourself and say, wait, it cannot be, right? I can't be saying that I only need to eat one meal the whole, for the whole week. It cannot be that I'm willing to drive in a very dark place and dangerous place and don't turn on my headlights. It is, doesn't make sense. I have to change. All right, so dear friends, God gave us his perfect word because it is so necessary for us. The third one, the Bible also tells us that it is our guide, not just our light, but our guide. Let's read together. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This guide prevents you from going onto the wrong track. All right, I will put it as this, the word of God prevents us from falling into sin. 
prevents us from falling into sin. Now, the first one is not only it tells you this is sin, this is sin. But when God says, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, now, the word of God changes you. It changes you. When the word of God is in your heart, it's in your heart. God didn't simply say the word of God um, um, will... Uh, your word will, not, will help me not to sin against you. No, only if the word is hid in your heart. The word hid in your heart, that I might not sin against you. Now, Christian, the more you read God's word, the more you make effort to take classes, FEBC classes, to come for Bible studies, to read the God's word yourself, to do your dig his word homework, the more you do that, the more it will change you. And when you see sin, when you face temptation, you do not, your inclination is not want to sin. You do not want to sin against God. I'm not saying we will become sinlessly perfect. But that I might not sin against you means you will want to resist temptation when the time comes. Now, very often people share with me, they say, you know, Pastor, I didn't feel like coming for Bible study today. But, you know, I thank God that I came because I was feeling down, I was feeling lazy, I was feeling I, I have no appetite for God's Word, you know, what's the point of going? But the person said, I forced myself to go anyway. And then when I listened, 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 he revived me. And he gave me insight and gave me a resolution in my heart to go back and say, ah, enough with this besetting sin, enough with it. My friend, the Word of God causes you to have spiritual appetite. The more you eat it, the more appetite you will have. That is why you will say, I don't want to sin. I challenge you, if you are a true believer, all right? No, I should not challenge you to do this, right? It's not good. If you spend a whole week not reading the Word of God, that's why I say I'm not challenging you, I'm not I'm suggesting you do that, all right? But you know, a whole week of not reading God's Word, and then just a whole week of taking in the things of the world on the internet, music, movies, just take it in. It is, you know the answer. It is almost guaranteed that by the end of the seven days, you have very little desire to obey God. You have very little desire to love Him. You have very have the little desire to serve Him. You have more and more desire for the world and yourself. So when God says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, He is not saying just, just use it. You need to hide it in your heart. You need to make it part of you. You must make it, you must remember it, memorize it, have it very abundant in your life. Just, just as simple as waking up in the morning and just leaving your um, Bible reading on. You will find that it prepares your heart for the day. You will say, Lord, I don't want to go near these sins. That what if I hid in my heart that I might, sin against, that I might not sin against you is something that is experiential, by many, uh, experiential for many Christians. So that is the word of God. Now, let us read um, Mark 13, 31 reading. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Why does God say you will never lose a single alphabet? Not a single jot and tittle, not a single alphabet will be lost. Why? Why? You see, the whole world, the whole universe can crumble, collapse, and implode or explode. But not a single alphabet of mine will be lost. Because this is how important it is to your life. Now, parents, all right? You know how important certain things are to your child. You know that you will do everything in, within your power till you die to make sure it is kept for them. Singles, you understand that as well. Certain things you know you need to have it. You make sure you do everything to protect it, right? Now that is why God says, I can let, not that, I can let everything in this, in this universe pass away. But there's one thing I want you to know. This will not pass away. All right, so child of God, treasure the word of God. The word of God endureth forever, okay? Now, let us look at the next paragraph. Some inquire after Christianity, but after a while, drop out 
Why? It is because they have neglected the study of God's word or they have rejected it in their unbelief. Some Christians never grow and mature in their Christian life because they do not study God's word. Some Christians get into a lot of trouble because they do not know God's word or they disobey it. Have you been growing as you ought to? That is, like I keep saying, there is no secret why we, we are not. Why we are not? Because God's word is not a major part of our daily life. All right? So, haven't you not looked around yourself, in, even in this church? How many have been with us since even when the church began? How many are there that have come and gone? How many are there that have come all excited about Christianity, but when you look at their Facebook today, they are in the world, or even for believers, professing who claim to them believers, with us for many years, no longer with us, and you look at their Facebook today, you say, are they even Christians? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? This can happen even to a believer. All right? That is what Satan wants. He cannot destroy your soul. But he knows he can destroy your life on earth and make you eternally a Christian that will eternally regret that you wasted your life on earth. That is what he wants. Even a Christian can fall into this backsliding that is so bad. All right? Loving the world. Cohabitation. Um, um, drunkenness so worldly, so immodest. Why? Why is it possible? Well, very simple. The light, the word has not been the light. They do not desire the milk. And they do not hide God's word in their heart. They do not grow. And as a result, they keep falling further and further away. Chastisements will come. All right, so Christian, when you look at those who have left, trace the problem. You will find that very often, most of them, they are not part of people who would come to study God's Word, who would take FEBC courses, and even if they are, you know that somewhere in their heart, they do not hide it, all right? They do not hide God's Word in their heart. They resist it instead, okay? By the way, if you hide God's Word, it means this. You take it, Right, you open your heart, you put it in there, and you, you put it inside, and you hold it very tight. That is hide. It takes a conscious effort. You don't hide means you resist it. No, I'm, keep it away. I don't want it. I may keep coming. So Christian, I want to ask you this. You come for a lot of Bible studies and so on. Do you hide God's word in your heart or you, do you resist God's word? Now let us then move. So what should the Christian do? What should a Christian do? Well, 2 Timothy 2.15, look at your BBK books. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So, a few things that God says. Now that you know you have my perfect word, and I personally inspired it, and I personally preserved it throughout all generations for you. Now, what should you do with it? What should you do with it? I emphasize again, this is basic Bible knowledge. You and I have to ask ourselves, is this a basic thing that is happening in my life? What is the basic thing? Look at what God says. Study the Word of God. Study. Begins with that. Study. Is that thing something that is so basically basic in our lives? It's so part of our life. I'll use an analogy. All right? Many of you here are students. Many of you here are students. What do you do in the majority of your waking hours besides things that you need to do as necessities of life? What do you do? Study. Study. Why? Because you are a student. And here God says, you are my child. You are living in a dangerous world. I need you to study. So the child of God must know I, am, I must be a student of God's word until I die. So this is not for young people to take FEBC courses, whatever age you are. God says, I look at you the same. I did not say, study when you are young. No, study simply means at any age, until you and I die. Studying the Word of God is a lifelong thing. The problem with us, we think, I'm a student, but 
graduate, I come out and work, I am not going to study anymore. I don't like studying. And we translate that to the life of a Christian. For the Christian, God simply gives the command, study, with no limit, limit of who, when, and until when. Okay? So, study, study. Parents, grandparents, you get upset when you see a child or grandchild. Why are you not studying? Why are you so lazy? You get very upset. You don't study, you're going to fail. Well, we need to say that to ourselves. Why are we not studying God's Word on our own when there are taught in church, when there are courses available? Why are we not studying? Maybe our grandchildren should say that to us, or our children. Mommy, Daddy, you're not studying God's Word. Grandpa, Grandma, you're not studying God's Word. Why? All right, children, maybe you're going to say that to them when they ask you, why are you not studying your schoolwork? Now, here I want to say something as well. Parents often think that doing well in secular studies is very important. So do grandparents. I'm not saying that it's not. It's part of our testimony that we are not lazy um, students. But we've come to a point by how society puts as what is the most important thing. We, our thinking, instead of being guided by the Word of God as light and lamp, we have been guided by the world. Where we say, don't spend so much time studying the Word of God. Don't spend so much time in church. Maybe you even tell your children, why are you spending so much time bringing my child, my grandchild, to church? They should spend more time studying secular things. Now, I'm not saying neglect your studies. But we've come to a point where we think the knowledge of the world in order to be success in this world is so important that we would allow it to supersede our time, our energy in the Word of God. Are you a parent? Are you a grandparent that actually feel that, ah, you know, it's very extreme to be so interested in the Word of God? By way of sharing, it's very painful sometimes to see this. You know, sometimes you have children come to church, young people. They love the Word of God. They, they want to know the Word of God. They want to obey the Word of God. So they study. And then they say, I wish, I really wish my parents who are Christians would love the Word of God, would, would know the Word of God and prepare themselves to meet God and spend their time in a useful way before they meet God. I wish my parents were like that, right? We see that. We see that. But it's equally painful to hear in real life, just recently, in fact. Children who love the Word of God and they're not lazy people who do not study. They do well in school. Christian parents say, you know, since you go to this church, uh, why are you reading the Bible every day? They get scolded for reading the Bible every day. The time you spend to read the Bible, you can spend more time studying and can do better. I'm very worried. You're obsessed with the Bible. Why? Because they, these parents, they themselves have not used the Word of God as a light and as a lamp to their own path. The light and the lamp that they have is the world's light. That is all. It's very sad to hear these young teenagers. They say, Why, are you still reading the Bible? Turn off your light now. I want you to sleep. Because I want you to be awake in school. Sleep now. For them to do their quiet time, they've turned off the light, turned, off a to turned on a torchlight, hide under the blanket to read God's Word. Why is it like that? Why has it come to this stage in Christianity? These are regular church attendees, parents who are regular church attendees. Why? Because what is hidden in their hearts today is the values of the world. God did not preserve His Word. God did not give us a perfect word for us to take it like textbooks, which are we, school textbooks, we have errors, which are written by men, and we make those more important than God's word. So parents, grandparents, young ones alike, please treasure that, right? 
Why are you always going to, why are you, why are you doing um, um, Bible study homework? You so much time, right? Tell you, tell you what, I give you more housework to do. These are Christian parents. If you have so much time, help me do more housework. Why are you spending time on that? Just once a week is enough. What's wrong with you? You think God gave us his perfect word for us to view it like that? God says the whole universe can pass away. But I want you to know that's one thing that will never pass away, his word. What does it mean? Heaven and earth will pass, can pass away, but my word shall never pass away. It will endure forever. It means this. Simply put, it is not about just God says, well, it, it won't disappear. The point of God saying that is to realize all the values in this world, being what, being in what position, having, possessing what kind of things in this world, all those values that the world say are important, they will pass away. But what I say in my word, how you ought to live, what is valuable, what is for etern what has eternal value, what is a meaningful purpose in living as a single, as a parent, as a family, as a church, what I put in my word in there is what is important for eternity. That is what it means. Not simply that it won't get lost. So the Christian then must view all these things very differently. My word will not pass away means what? When I obey it, when I live by it, even if the world mocks me, even the world thinks this is a waste of time, waste of money, but that value that God says that this, do this, study, obey, live by it, I will have eternal joy. I will have eternal values. I will have eternal rewards. I will have eternal um, thankfulness to God. It will last. So Christian, whatever it is that is subseding, uh, superseding the word of God, it's time to think why God says, well, my word will last forever. All right? Now, so study. Then you say, then what do I do? Your child goes to school, starts school, all right? Or starts university. Because school system here, I understand, is different. No homework, right? Starts university or even high school and then your child comes back every day and doesn't do his homework doesn't open the book doesn't read doesn't revise you what will you say to the child hey child you know you need to change now you know you are at the grade where you need to study all right it's not go to school and play and show and tell you need to make some changes in your life now right some of many of you tell your children that now you're in high school you know there is there are tests there are exams you can't treat it like nothing. You are now saved. God is saying you are now saved. Some changes have to happen. It doesn't matter how old you are. Don't say, well, for young people. Or for when I am grown up. Or when I retire. You see, retirees will say for young people. Young people say when I'm retired. But God says some changes must begin the minute after you are saved. You must become a student that seriously study God's word. So you must have this change of thinking. God told Nicodemus, you must be like a newborn babe crawling out of your mother's womb. Means now you must think what I tell you, you must see as truth that you will make part of your life and make those changes. We'll come later on to see now what are these changes that we can make. But for now, this word study, and then we close, all right? For now, this word study, it means, the word is not just study. The word study has the picture of someone who's studying so hard that he's perspiring. It's hard labor. That is what it is. So this is not an ordinary word study in Greek. It is a word that, that brings up the picture of hard labor. Is it hard? St having work? having schoolwork, having family to take care of it, and still come to study God's Word, and still do your quiet time, and still take FEBC course, anytime you feel, oh, this is really too hard. Well, that's exactly what God has told you to do. Study. Don't look at it as strange. Don't look at it as unnecessary. Don't look at it as, as um, something that uh, I think is optional. No, because this study means this is your new life after you are saved. But if that new life has not been part of your life, you have to realize, God says, oh, as a Christian, that is supposed to be my normal life. Like I tell my children, hey, this is your normal life, you know, you're a student. You have to do homework. You have to put in effort. 
You have to revise. I have to tell myself that. Study. Let us pray.